Good evening, and welcome to the premiere of The Life and Legacy of William J. Hughes. I'm John Fringen, Executive Director of the Hughes Center for Public Policy. We're glad you're here. Dr. Harvey Kesselman, President of Stockton University, will now offer a few welcoming remarks. Thank you, Dr. Fringen. Good evening, and thank all of you for joining us tonight as we celebrate the life and accomplishments of Ambassador William J. Hughes, a tireless advocate for Stockton University and an individual we're honored to have called a dear friend and colleague. Tonight's premiere showing of the life and legacy of William J. Hughes is a documentary that chronicles the personal and career highlights of Bill and his wife, Nancy, and his family. Bill was one of the most accomplished leaders ever in South Jersey a U.S. Congressman for 20 years, the U.S. Ambassador to Panama, and a very popular educator right here at Stockton. He was a model of bipartisanship and political grace, and he believed firmly in the power of civic engagement, which is a guiding principle at Stockton. Our William J. U. Center for Public Policy continues honoring his legacy through research, panel discussions, student programs, election debates, and public opinion polling. In fact, the Youth Center provided support for tonight's film as a testament to the personal and career achievements of Ambassador Hughes, achievements which continue to impact the citizens of this region, our state, and nation. And now, please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Ed Salmon, longtime chair of the Youth Center Steering Committee, who will talk a bit more about the film and the Hughes family legacy. Thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kesselman. Hey, it's great to have everybody join us for this premiere showing tonight. I have to start off with a thank you to President Kesselman for your outstanding leadership and a lifetime of dedication for Stockton University. We greatly treasure your support and the support of the Board of Trustees. Thank you also to John Frugin and the great Hughes Center staff for your hard work and dedicated efforts to make this premier film event a great success tonight. Thank you to all my fellow Hughes Center Steering Committee members for your advice, guidance, support throughout the year. For 10 years, I tried to convince and talk Bill and Nancy into doing a lifetime legacy, living legacy film. I was unsuccessful. And then finally, in 2016, I won the battle and we started production. The Hughes Center is thrilled that now and for future generations, we have the amazing lifetime story of Bill and Nancy Hughes. You know, the Hughes family is exceptional. The four children are very prominent in everything they do in their families. And they work very hard to make sure that their mother and father legacy continues on. And I'm so proud of all four of them and their family members. Who now speak on behalf of the Hughes family it is my honor and privilege to call on William J. Hughes, Jr. to say a few words. Bill, would you please say a few words? Thank you, Dr. Salmon, and thank you, Dr. Kesselman and Dr. Frugin. You know, for a boy from Church Street in Penns Grove and a girl from Central Avenue in Moorestown, our parents sure left their mark throughout Southern New Jersey, the country, and indeed beyond its borders. They did it together. And tonight you will, hear, you will see their story and hear what motivated them in their fantastic adventure together. Family, faith, public service, and giving back to our communities. The William J. Hughes Center for Public Policy continues their legacy of promoting civility and public discourse, providing insight and perspectives on issues affecting both Southern New Jersey and the nation, and offering students the opportunity to explore public service as a worthy calling. This mission is only possible through your continued support, through both the money you donate and the interest you show in the programs the center offers. On behalf of the entire Hughes family, my sisters, Lynn, Barbara, Tama, 
me, our spouses and families, and especially our Uncle Dan Hughes, whom my father loved so much. We thank you for your generosity, for your interest, and for your support. Now, please enjoy the program. Have a great night. Thank you, Bill. And I have to thank Dr. Kesselman, Dr. Salmon, and my steering committee, and the entire Hughes family for their support of the Hughes Center. It has really been uh, wonderful and really helpful to our, our success. You know, the Hughes Center supports Stockton students through programming, internships, and research opportunities. But Hughes Center programs also directly benefit the public, especially in South Jersey. We host election debates that allow voters to evaluate the candidates. Our polling institute gives local residents a voice in important issues. And the general public is invited to virtually every program the Hughes Center puts on, like the showing of tonight's film. Perhaps most important, the Hughes Center promotes civility in politics and civic engagement we carry on the legacy of Bill Hughes and your donations of any amount carry on that work too. We thank all our supporters who have generously donated. Let's take a moment to recognize our sponsors and Hughes Center partners as we start the life and legacy of William J. Hughes. Hope you enjoy the program. Much of New Jersey is bordered by water. To the east, the Atlantic Ocean, to the west, the Delaware River. And it was water that would figure prominently in the career of a man, William John Hughes, born in the small town of Penns Grove in the year 1932. It was a tumultuous and often despairing time in the midst of the Great Depression, but the Hughes family survived. Father William worked as an engineer at the Atlantic City Electric Generating Station in Deepwater. Later, he and wife Pauline owned a seafood market. They, son William, who went by the name Jack, younger brother Dan and sisters Charlotte and Paula, lived in a two-story house with, from time to time, an assortment of relatives. A large garden and coop of chickens helped the family get by and young Jack learned the value of responsibility, working various part-time jobs. By age 12, he worked summers full-time as a busboy. In school, Jack was a good student. His favorite course at Penns Grove Elementary was civics, and afterward he wondered if this set his mind toward his eventual goals, because Jack, then and later, was if nothing else civic-minded. But though he did well in high school, furthering his education would prove difficult. We had a great uh, life in growing up together as brothers. We had a very small home. Bill and I uh, slept together because in our home uh, there was, wasn't much room. We uh, always played outside. We had a great uh, home and a, and, a, and, a, and a great backyard, a lot of space. We played uh, Hang and go seek. We played cowboys and Indians uh, together, uh, uh, Bill, and I never forget the time I uh, jumped on him out of a bush and I pulled my gun, my cap pistol, and hit him in the uh, head with the end of the cap pistol. And did I ever get a whipping for that? Well, when I graduated from high school, like a lot of young people, I didn't wasn't sure what I wanted to do. But I remember my dad came to Wildwood to visit me. He called me Jack. Uh, his name was Bill. So to differentiate between him and myself, they, the family called me Jack when I worked at Groff's Restaurant on the boardwalk. And I worked at Groff's for many years, starting out as a dishwasher, then pie boy, and then short order cook. And he said, Jack, what do you want to do now that you're out of high school? And I said, well, you know, Dad, uh, I'm not sure, but you know, I've always thought I'd like to be a, be a professional, maybe a lawyer. He said, well, go for it. 
you know, go to college and, and become a lawyer. I said, well, you know, maybe I'll go back to my high school in Pensgrove and talk to the principal, which I did the following week when I had a day off. And I went to see Mr. Brooks uh, in his office and he had my file on his desk and he opened it up and he, he said, uh, how can I help you? I said, well, Mr. Brooks, I think I'd like to become a lawyer. And he looked at me and he said, forget it. You don't have the background for being a lawyer. He said, go to Goldie Beacom, which is a very good business school in Wilmington. And I said, oh, well, thank you, Mr. Brooks, for your time today. And I was mad. I have to thank Mr. Brooks because he probably is the one that made me determined that I was going to become a lawyer. Bill, there are th three things I can remember about Bill. First of all, he was very quiet. He was, uh, he was not a guy that was bubbly or, you know, you all of a sudden walk in and say, oh man, that's Bill Hughes. Bill was very quiet. He's a very great student and he really liked people. From there, Bill was, uh, entered into night school uh, in Rutgers University. Uh, and he uh, started his law at Rutgers and went from Rutgers night school uh, to Brunswick, Rutgers. Uh, and then from there he uh, still working hard, worked for the electric company and in between and trying to pay his way through college. I first met Bill Hughes when we were in our first year in law school in Camden. We started with a class of 20. The school had been the College of South Jersey and it was taken over by Rutgers. When we came in, uh, the third year law students graduated two, two students. We started with a class of 20 and ended up with eight. Now, I tell you that because that type of tension in school uh, causes you to form a close relationships with your friends because you're going through a common experience. But we formed a very close relationship. Because we were a small group, we would have lunch together, uh, we would talk cases together, and it came to the point where Jack was no longer joining the group. So we sent a reconnaissance group out to find him. And here he was in the lunchroom of the college across the street with this young lady, Nancy, which is the first time I met what eventually became his wife. Nancy was the love of his life. She was such a beautiful lady. I've never had such a beautiful lady that I loved so much uh, as Nancy. Well, I graduated from law school in 1958, and I said to Nancy and my in-laws, you know, I, had, I was told by Bob Stanton, uh, my law school friend, that there's an opportunity uh, that, uh, for an internship that sounded real good. And Nancy said, Ocean City? No fooling, is that right? Oh, that would be wonderful. I said, do you think so? She said, yeah, so I called. The internship was still available and I took it and never left. I stayed there for the balance of my legal career. Bill saw Nancy Gibson strolling through campus one day in March of 1956 and that was it. He wrangled an introduction, asked for a date, and though a financially struggling student, married her the following Thanksgiving. This courtship for Bill was part of a lifelong pattern. When Bill Hughes saw what he wanted, obstacles might hinder his way, but nothing stopped him. Bill and Nancy went on to have three daughters, Lynn, Barbara, and Tama, and a son, William. Lynn, uh, who is uh, as blonde as they come, uh, Barbara, who is uh, the only non-lawyer in the family, as I've said often, uh, she went straight. She's in healthcare. Uh, Tama, who is now a, a judge in New Jersey, and Bill, who also is a lawyer, practicing lawyer. 
You know, my sisters and I, it was almost like two families. There were the three of us, and then my brother Bill was like our, um, our play toy. He, he came along seven years after, you know, me. And we just, we had a ball. We, our family is a very close family. And I think through dad's career and mom managing the household, but also managing his campaigns, we're a very close family, you know, from the trips um, to, family trips were always an adventure, um, whether it was camping or, uh, going to Florida or, you know, my parents' favorite spot, um, St. Thomas, they fell in love with the Virgin Islands and we in turn grew to love the Virgin Islands. So it was always, you know, a great time to be together. They had, um, they had a wonderful married life. They had a, not only a life as husband and wife, but they also had a working relationship that they just, um, they complimented each other. My father, uh, I, at that point I was like 17, so he was here every weekend. I don't think he missed many weekends. As a matter of fact, I think we probably can count on one hand how many times he stayed in D.C. So he was here most of the time. Certainly all three daughters joined him in D.C. when we all went to college together. So it was, uh, and then my mother finally realized, what am I doing here in Ocean City? I'm going to join everyone down in D.C. So when we were dating, growing up, and our boyfriends or our date would drop us off and know if Chris kisses goodbye, Dad would have the bugle out on the deck and start playing the bugle. In 1974, and I have vivid recollections of it just being a, uh, a family affair. My Uncle Dan uh, took an old boat trailer and he made a huge rolling billboard with a uh, with a broom on the side and it said, let's sweep house in 74. He would drive that around to all of the parades and, and uh, people would egg it, uh, throw eggs at it or, or, you know, and the like, but he was very proud of that. If I'm telling a story, I'm telling a story about my mom and dad and about the laughter, about the gamesmanship, about the one-upsmanship, about, um, you know, people don't see that about my dad, they see his career, they think, and it's very distinguished, but they don't see him, they see him this way, and I see my dad this way, as my dad, and my dad and mom, and their relationship, not to take away, because you can't, this accomplishments, but everybody has to remember, he was our dad first, and a husband, and a son, before he became a congressman, an ambassador. And he continued to be all of those while he was, has this an amazing career. He was deciding whether he should go by Bill in the office and maybe Jackie at home, or Jack at home, and they weren't sure, maybe Jack in the office and Bill at home, and my oldest cousin, Barry Jr., overheard the conversation when he was very young and started calling him Jackie. Nancy and Bill Hughes were probably two of the most dedicated husbands and wives that I've ever, ever known. I don't think there was anything that Bill ever would have done that Nancy would have disapproved. Now, sometimes when we could get Bill out by ourselves, we, we might try to talk him into a little trouble once in a while, but it would never be anything that would be really bad. It was all done in jest and in fun. And as Nancy became ill in late years, I've never seen a more devoted husband than Bill was to Nancy. Bill, a Democrat partially due to his admiration for late President John Kennedy, decided to run for Congress in 1970 in typical Bill Hughes fashion. He wanted something important done. No one would do it, so he took on the job. About 1967, the seashore along the eastern seaboard was experiencing beach closings. And I became a member of an organization which was based in Wildwood, New Jersey, called SOS, we called it, Save Our Seas. And it was an environmental organization that wanted to bring attention to the damage that was being done to our coastal waters by dumping 
I mean, anything you can think of, people were dumping in the ocean. Sewage sludge by the thousands and thousands of tons. Off Cape May, it was damaging that about two or three miles off the coast, damaging our waters, impacting our clam industry, our fishing industry. They were dumping tens of thousands of sludge off the New York Bight, northern New Jersey, uh, every, every week. And it was cheaper, I mean, to dump in the ocean than to build land-based alternatives. And it was closing our beaches for weeks on end. And our tourism industry suffered. People were going to other tourist destinations as a result. And we were hurting. And this was going on every summer for any number of summers. And I wrote to our sitting congressman at the time, uh, who I knew very well. I tried criminal cases against the sitting congressman. And I asked him what he was doing to deal with this problem. It was damaging our area. And he lived near the coast himself. And I got a form letter back. And it started out, Dear William, I still have it downstairs in my files. And thank you for bringing this to my attention. This is an important issue. No explanation of what he's doing about it. And I, the more I thought about it, the madder I got. And I came home to Nancy, my wife, and I said, Nancy, look at this letter. See what he wrote to me? I said, you know, I'm tempted to leave the prosecutor's office and take him on run for Congress. And she said, well, Jack, go for it. Why not? Nancy's impact on Bill's, the whole length of Bill's career is immeasurable. Uh, one, they had an easy camaraderie between them and enjoyed one another's company. And Bill trusted Nancy's judgment and he appreciated her um, excellent memory and organizational skills. And uh, even in the later years when she was very sick and wasn't even able to speak, if uh, we were sitting by the pool somewhere and discussing some interesting old campaign or event, and Nancy would put her hand up and, and Bill would say, uh-oh, uh, let's check in here and find out what the actual day is or who this person was. Um, she was just um, a fundamental resource for him, both emotionally and personally and professionally. He could identify the problem quickly, and he, uh, he had uh, an attitude of, of wanting to work with other people. I mean, part of it was, I mean, he definitely felt uh, a little more conservative than a typical Democrat. I mean, he was in a district that um, the, the Almanac for American Politics called a Republican bastion. When he, when he won the district, I mean, he beat Charles Sandman, who was an ultra conservative. Bill ran against Sandman in 70 and lost, and then came back and beat Sandman in 74, and that's when his congressional career began. I worked with Bill in the campaign. Uh, did a number of things. Uh, probably the most memorable was I was his driver, so I got to drive all around the South Jersey with uh, with Bill. I had I ran my campaign on a, on twenty five thousand dollars, about fifteen thousand of that was my money. Nobody thought I had a chance. In fact, uh, interesting story. I went to visit the mayor of Millville. Bill Hughes came into my mayor's office and let me know he was running for Congress against Charlie Sandman. Now, Charlie was just unbeatable, in my opinion. And I sat down with Ed, and I said, Ed, I'm, I'm running for Congress, as you know, and uh, I'd like to have your support. You were a major figure in Cumberland County. And he was very nice. I mean, I liked him from the very beginning. And so I went home and told my wife, some crazy guy came in here thinking he was gonna beat Charlie Sandman and run for Congress. I frankly had not had a conversation with Ed Salmon before that conversation one day in Millville. The first time he ran against Sandman, he lost. Bill sat out the 1972 congressional election, 
feeling the timing was not right. But in 1974, national politics had changed. The Watergate scandal had forced President Richard Nixon from office, and Democrats across the country knew they had a chance to win seats on the local, state, and federal levels, which included Bill's turf, the long Republican-dominated second district. Well, frankly, in 1972, my senior partner, French Loveland, died. So I had the full responsibility for the firm at that point. And we still had beach closings. And we still didn't see anything, even after the campaign, didn't see any activity on the part of the incumbent to deal with the problem. And I, Watergate intervened. It was a better year uh, to run as a Democrat. Also, uh, I almost decided not to run at one point for all the reasons I enumerated before, that is, uh, the costs uh, I had family to run, couldn't afford to carry for very long uh, all my obligations uh, with the congressional salary. Although in the interim, I had made other investments which were successful and, and, and I decided that I wanted to take on uh, the incumbent again over, mostly over ocean dumping. And we also had another problem. While a Democrat could not win a congressional seat because it was overwhelmingly Republican. And people were disbelievers at first that I could win. And we brought them around. But Nancy was the one that helped build a uh, massive get out the vote out effort. Uh, she was the one that helped put together the volunteers. She's on the telephone every day at the beginning, trying to line up volunteers to help us in the various counties that I represented in Congress eventually. She was an amazing control officer of what was going on. When you have five or 600 volunteers, you need somebody that can keep them happy, pull them together, assign jobs to them, make sure they're all happy. Nancy did all that. She was the one that basically helped put together the volunteer organization and oversaw it. You know, Bill and I have known each other for 40 years. And in fact, uh, I had the good sense uh, to come and campaign for him in 1974. And he was winning by 20 points and he won in spite of my coming. He, uh, he still won, notwithstanding I was here. But uh, that's how long we've known each other. Bill, Bill Hughes. Just take it a little farther. Was a genuine, down to earth person. He was a wonderful campaigner. First of all, he knew how to listen to people. If you if you watch Ambassador Hughes, watch how he makes contact with you. He never loses eye contact with you. He hears what you're saying. That's a trait that not enough politicians have. They start looking at the next person, they start looking at the next dollars. No, he never loses that. He listens and he went back to Congress and represented what he felt the people of his district needed, and it was a big district. Campaigning, um, we would do sometimes four and five chicken barbecues uh, a day, and uh, uh, my mother would look at us and you know we would go from there to there, and once we went to the chicken barbecues, Dad would say, okay, if we, once we go through this, we'll get you an ice cream cone. We would, uh, I remember back in the 1970 campaign, uh, Dad said to his daughters, if you stuff all of this, and I think there was about 60,000, I'll get you an eclair. <laughs> it was an interesting campaign, uh, both my 1970 campaign as well as my 1974 campaign. But I remember uh, in 1974, it was a much more competitive race. I could tell just getting around the district that uh, it was a favorable environment for me because people wanted to change. We had gone through Watergate, and if I heard once, I heard 25 times during the campaign when I'm out talking to people, time for a change. My mother was the iron fist with a velvet glove. She kept on saying she was a homemaker, but she was more than that. She was the campaign manager for my father. She raised money. Uh, she would go back, she would make us dinner, go back, and the workers uh, from the various unions would come back and to do various things, whether it's um, stuffing mails or making phone calls. 
She was there until 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, but she was very active in his campaign. They were together all the time. Well, we were, uh, we were fortunate because we came in with uh, 75 new Democrats uh, who, and that, uh, the, the numbers alone uh, gave us uh, a considerable amount of power beyond, uh, beyond what freshmen in Congress normally had. And we came in uh, as a reform class. In, in some ways, it reminds me of these days, uh, where people were uh, fairly uh, unhappy with Congress, uh, with government generally. It was, it was a period when the Vietnam War was uh, 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 very unpopular. The Congress was not popular. And so we came in at a time when we had the opportunity to uh, reform uh, some of the procedures in Congress, open it up, uh, so that younger members like ourselves could contribute in ways that were not possible before. He was like a bull in a china shop and he took on uh, political icons in Atlantic City for corruption to the point where he was affecting the economics of their profession. When the people of South Jersey first elected me to Congress, I made a promise to you and to myself that I would bring not just leadership to public office, but integrity as well. Since then, we've seen new jobs and progress come to our entire region. I've worked hard to address the concerns of working people, families, and older Americans. As chairman of the Crime Subcommittee, I've pushed through tough new measures to combat terrorism, drug trafficking, child pornography, and the illegal dumping of waste. But most of all, I'm proud that I've been able to earn your trust over these many years. Beginning with his first attempt to win office in 1970, Bill Hughes fought a long and difficult battle against forces opposed to protecting the ocean. Ocean dumping was a big issue here in South Jersey. Uh, as, we, as you know, we have a, an economy in South Jersey that's very dependent on, on clean water, clean oceans waters, uh, boating, swimming. Uh, a lot of businesses depend on three good months a year uh, to make their, uh, uh, the, their financial targets for the entire year. And so when it became obvious that our abuse of the oceans, the dumping, the ocean outfalls, uh, sewage uh, outfalls going into the ocean were really wreaking havoc on a lot of major industries, fishing industry, uh, the beach and tourism industries. It became a very high priority. His freshman year in Congress, he took on three of the biggest targets that anybody could ever consider taking on. I got into politics and government because I was unhappy with the way we treated our ocean. There will be a number of issues that uh, we will focus attention, national attention on. And no doubt, Such a number of trips chair, back and forth. Attending hearings, voting on the House floor, more meetings, more voting. My first ocean dumping bill just banned ocean dumping. And then when the, Ron when the Reagan administration came along, the EPA director uh, basically took another look at the, the law and interpreted it to balance in the cost. And of course, when you factor in costs, the ocean dumping bill is gutted because you can't compete. There's no comparison between the cost of dumping in the ocean and the cost of building an alternative. Well, this was really uh, this was really a great uh, opportunity for to do what Bill said he wanted to do, and that was to work together on issues of mutual importance and mutual concern. And the Ocean Dumping Ban Act was a bill which, that was put in place and passed by the Merchant Marine and Fisheries Committee, uh, which rectified some of the problems that had been caused to the original Ocean Dumping Act uh, by the courts. Uh, obviously, clean water, clean oceans are extremely important uh, still today and were back then to his district and my district, to his constituents and my constituents. And so Bill wanted to work together and we did. I worked with, on the Republican side, he on the Democrat side, and we got the bill passed. Bill was very persistent and there's no question that the defining legislation that he wrote was the ocean dumping ban. He used to say, put four kids through college on ocean dumping. He got an assignment uh, early on in Congress that he sought to be on the House Merchant Marine and Fisheries Committee, which for many members was kind of a backwater committee, maybe not very important, didn't do a lot of interesting things. But for Bill, it was a plum assignment because it gave him an opportunity to address 
ocean dumping very directly. And one day during his first term in office, we were noodling uh, the night before a, a bill was to come up in Merchant Marine and Fisheries. Uh, the uh, Marine Sanctuaries and Protection Act reauthorization. This is a bill that came up every year, very routine. We talked about it and we said, hey, why don't we just drop an amendment on this bill to ban ocean dumping? And we looked at each other and said, you know, that could work. It was a war of attrition, but when you're right on an issue, uh, you're gonna win eventually. This is the ocean dumping bill signed by Ronald Reagan that finished the job, as you may know, the 1977 law was challenged in court by New York City in 1980. And while we got a lot of dumpers out, many chemical dumpers and, and municipal sl sludge dumpers, uh, New York undercut it by interposing in, in the consideration of uh, the ban whether or not the costs should be taken into account. Well, once they interjected costs into it, it was never, of course, intended why the ocean always loses because it's much cheaper to dump in the ocean. So I had to go back and reach a consensus again and that resulted in the 1988 Ocean Dumping Reform Act, which was signed by Ronald Reagan, which finished the job and forced all the other chemical and sludge dumpers out of the ocean. Companies were polluting. Uh, people, the beaches were in jeopardy. Uh, um, you know, uh, and the work you did, Bill, helped ensure that future generations, not just your great grandkids, but everyone's are still going to be able to enjoy the summers at the beach, or you, as we say here, summers at the shore. The 1970s was a time of increasing environmental awareness, when people began saying that areas like New Jersey's immense pine barrens were not merely state, but national treasures needing protection. Another piece of legislation that Bill worked on that I think was really just critical in the environmental area was the Pine Lands Preservation Act. Um, that particular act uh, um, was, try was trying to preserve the Pinelands, um, uh, a big part of Bill's district, and it also went into other districts in South Jersey are the, are the Pinelands, which are critical for a number of reasons. Uh, there's a big aquifers there that are, are critical. It's a great w wildlife habitat, a lot of things going on there. Well, the, the Pinelands, uh, aside from being a, just a beautiful place to be, and for those people who live there, a beautiful place to live, is a very important ecological uh, structure for the southern part of New Jersey and for the northern part of New Jersey, for that matter, because of the water that's, that, that's in the water table. And not only that, but uh, in New Jersey, among, of all places, we should be protective of the open space we have left. And uh, that, the, the Pine Lands Preservation Act provided a great opportunity for us to put in place policies that would protect the op open spaces and thereby the water that's underneath those open spaces. Oh, well, I mean, you just go back to um, the John McPhee's book on the Pine Barrens, and it's basically the last great protected water supply in America. The, there's something like 17 trillion gallons of fresh water under the pine lands. That was, that was probably the biggest reason. And I, and I think people in North Jersey wanted to keep it for themselves because there's been times during droughts when they wanted to ship tanker trucks down to grab some of that water. Congressman Foresight and I introduced a bill and Jim Florio introduced a bill. And so we sat down at one point and worked out a compromise Unfortunately, when that compromise, which passed the Congress overwhelmingly, the bill that Florio and I put together along with uh, Ed Forsyth, uh, it, it had the, the counties, the county planning agencies more, more directly involved in trying to be fairer to property owners. And unfortunately, when, uh, when the state of New Jersey implemented the legislation, they did not follow that mandate. But by and large, it was the right, the right thing to do to protect that area. That watershed is very important for 
New Jersey. We, we were both very interested in the Pine Lands Preservation Act. Uh, I was a young congressman at the time, and so it take, took a while for me to develop the kind of expertise and clout that it would take to uh, really engineer a bill like that. Jim Florio was there, and Jim Florio was a Democrat, and, and uh, Bill and I worked with uh, Jim Florio on the Pine Lands Preservation Act. And uh, after it went into effect, we continued to work on it because uh, there was a, a fair amount of, um, of discord that was created by the Pine Lands Act because everybody couldn't do with their land all the things they could do before the Pine Lands Act was passed. And so it gave us uh, something very much in common to work on together. The National Rifle Association has long felt that proponents of gun control were the enemy, and in 1981 it named Bill Hughes, then chairman of the Congressional Subcommittee on Crime, public enemy number one. That was probably one of my d more difficult issues because southern New Jersey is very rural. A lot of gun clubs. In fact, I happen to be a, a member, an honorary member of the of the Salem County Sportsman's Club. Uh, my brother was very actively involved in that. And as a young man, I was, I was a hunter. I, I hunted with my dad for a, a number of years. Not, I wasn't much of a good shot, I must admit, but I enjoyed those years. And so it became a difficult issue, but with the incidents of, of abuse, criminal abuse by weapons, and the fact that, you know, what is sporting? I mean, I never saw the need for people to own a machine gun or a bazooka or a nuclear weapon. <laughs> I mean, you have to draw the line somewhere. Who needs, who needs an automatic weapon? My philosophy was pretty close to uh, Senator Goldwater, who once said, you know, if you need more than two shots in the woods when you're hunting, you don't belong there. Well, fortunately, New Jersey has the toughest gun laws of any state. And, and they're sensible gun laws. Hey, I believe in someone's right to have a, a hunting rifle, someone's right to protect themselves. But why would you need an assault weapon? And I still can't understand why we have laws that would allow individuals to go out and buy assault weapons. They're literally uh, ways in which to conduct war is assault weapon. And so we were effective to be able to ban assault weapons here in the state of New Jersey. Just as gun violence was spreading, so was the use of illegal drugs. Bill sought solutions to these intertwined problems. We saw that the traffickers also were acquiring major assets. I mean, we had traffickers acquiring small submarines, airplanes where they had fleets of airplanes, big boats, cigarette boats, fast boats. Uh, we had to figure a way to take that away from them. So we developed legislation called forfeiture, giving the authorities, the prosecutors and district attorneys, the authority to go after their assets and forfeit them and use the money that we collect, and, and it was billions of dollars, against them. That was a whole concept of forfeiture. And we passed legislation to do that. And it wasn't long before we were seizing, I mean, billions of dollars. And not just money, but other assets that we used or sold. I mean, we had a fleet of Rolls Royces uh, that we seized in Florida over time and other places, and airplanes and ships. Certain chemicals, precursor drugs that were manufactured in the United States, and Bill <clears throat> got a bill passed uh, signing a law that uh, restricted <clears throat> the shipments of these precursor drugs down into the South American countries to try to put a dent in their ability to produce heroin and cocaine. And this is something that you might find of interest. This was signed by Ronald Reagan in 1983, and that's the Anti-Tampering Act. That was the response to the Tylenol tampering, product tampering, mm -hmm. where people had laced Tylenol with uh, the poisonous substance arsenic, and uh, 
As a result of that and other similar instances, why I wrote a law that makes it a federal offense to tamper with products like Tylenol. And of course, it's been used any number of times. The 1980s were particularly difficult uh, because uh, the drug problem uh, was getting out of hand in some respects. And Bill, as chairman of the subcommittee on crime, uh, had the opportunity to uh, uh, take the leadership role on uh, uh, anti-crime legislation. If you really want to get things done, you have to understand that the process depends upon people after the election, whether a Democrat or a Republican, to put partisan politics aside and work for everybody. You represent everybody at that point. If you don't do that, uh, you don't, you drop the ball and you won't get things across the goal line, so it's essential. In 1958, the federal government established in Pomona the National Aviation Facility Experimental Center. 38 years later, it was renamed in honor of William J. Hughes. Now, a lot of people don't know about our FAA Technical Center in Pomona. That's over 45 exceptionally talented individuals in research and technology. People don't know that our uh, William J. Hughes Technical Center is not the finest technical and research center in America. It's the finest in the world. It'll have the responsibility when we take aviation from radar to satellite to oversee all that work so that is done throughout not just America, but throughout the world. And without Bill Hughes, we wouldn't have that technical center today. He led the fight to keep it from being located in Oklahoma and to keeping it here in New Jersey, where it has grown and become recognized as the world's best. In the, in the beginning, uh, the facility was known as NAFET, National Air Facilities Experimental Center. Uh, or FAA Tech Center, and uh, that there was uh, a lot. There were other places around the country that also coveted this uh, this facility. They would like to see it in their hometown. And there was a case that to be made for moving it to Oklahoma. Bill marshaled all his resources. He was able to to uh, reverse that decision and bring it consolidated here in South Jersey. And as a recognition and an honor, uh, Congress decided to rename it the, Fe the William J. Hughes FAA Technical Center. Oh, the best part of the job is the ability to help people with their problems, being able to cut through red tape. And in Washington, there is a lot of red tape, which is why Bill Hughes says the worst part of his job over the years has been dealing with all of that bureaucracy in government. But the good has outweighed the bad, and his passion for the task at hand is why Hughes has stayed so long. Bill Hughes left Congress in 1994, feeling it was time to move on. The collaborative type of legislative process he enjoyed had lost favor, replaced by what he considered win-at-all-cost tactics that did not serve the country. Congress was becoming moribund, something Bill wanted no part of. For him, the question became, what would he do next? A proponent of the give and take, he still wanted to give. And so, when the ambassadorship of Panama was offered, Bill Hughes took it. Well, for me, having been with the congressman for as long as I had, I was not totally surprised by his announcement. I always knew that he did not intend to spend his entire life in Congress and that uh, he had other plans in his life. Plans which include some teaching, speeches, perhaps more politics, and definitely more family time. I don't want to make it sound like my career years are over, because they're not. As I've often said, I'm not retiring from life, I'm just retiring from Congress. I want to do other things. I never saw anybody in my life that worked as hard as him. Uh, Bill served 20 years. That's a long time to serve in the United States Congress. I wasn't surprised. What did surprise me was when Al Gore asked him if he'd consider being an ambassador. And that was one of the most important times in the history of America with Panama. With his efforts, we put the Panama Canal back in the hands of the Panamanians. And that was a major feat that was done by Ambassador Hughes. Well, first of all, Panama is a beautiful country, and uh, 
I never realized until I traveled the country that it's probably one of the best kept secrets as a tourist destination. It's a beautiful country. The people, they love America. They don't like the way we treated them for many years when we had the Panama Canal and regulated both sides of the canal. I found the people to be wonderfully, wonderfully outgoing, lovely people. I found also that it was safe, even though I had a security team that protected me. I really didn't need it. I don't ever remember ever being in trouble of any sort. And I traveled extensively throughout the country. So I found it beautiful. I found it to be engaging with the people. And it was probably one of the best years, some of the best years of our life. And I got to be with Nancy. And then in which he became ambassador it was, a, it was kind of an interesting one also. He was nominated, and it's often the case that political games are played and holes are put on uh, confirmation uh, of ambassadors for unrelated matters. And it was held up for several months. I was extremely impressed with uh, his humility and authenticity. Uh, the other is that, uh, that Ambassador Hughes uh, clearly wanted to understand the capability of the U.S. Army uh, and the joint forces that were resident right there uh, in Panama. Um, he, he also uh, wanted to, to ensure we had teamwork not only between the military, which was our responsibility to, in, the, in the joint world, but also to work uh, in close concert with his country team at the, at the embassy. But, uh, but generally, there, there was no question that, uh, that Ambassador Hughes uh, made a difference, you know, in, uh, 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 in terms of uh, uh, he helped provide uh, uh, additional boats, for example, for, for Panama to, uh, to guard against the, the, uh, the trafficking of drugs. While he was ambassador, Panama created this money laundering center, which was probably the, the first in, in, in South America. And, and very importantly, uh, Ambassador Hughes had excellent relations with, with, uh, with uh, the U.S. military, U.S. Southcom, that was then stationed in Panama. You know, when you think of, you know, the Panama Canal and, and what, that, what that represented, not only in terms of, of, of international trade and transportation, but it, but symbolically, I mean, you know, we built it, you know, we, to make the transfer over uh, was, had to be handled very, very delicately, as you can well imagine. It had to be handled with a lot of aplomb and a lot of, a lot of delicacy, a lot of skill. And he was, he was the, he was the person for the, for the job, certainly. We were, we were very fortunate. During his tenure as the ambassador to, to Panama, he was able to separate the business side of it. And when we came into the ambassador's residence or we saw them at events or, or met with them socially, uh, it was a friendship that was, was developed. Both of them understood that for uh, the U.S. mission to be successful in Panama, it was all about relationships and them as a couple, uh, they, they knew how to build friendships uh, Im immediately. Uh, by, by building these friendships, what did you do? You built trust, and as a result of this trust, then it ultimately resulted in tremendous teamwork and cohesion. I always felt that we had a great unity of effort. You know, that's a principle of war. But it's a principle, really, in life that if you want to succeed, you got to have everybody pulling on the rope in the same direction. And and the Hughes uh, made us feel like family. And so, you know, to talk to him, it was like talking to a peer. I mean, clearly, he was the the most senior U.S. representative in that country. You know, he's tasked as a U.S. ambassador to uh, to take U.S. foreign policy and bring it to the fore in that, in that country. And his job is not only to lead his country team and the foreign service officers that work for him, but also all the other U.S. representatives within the country. I never, I never sensed any adversarial relationship. And I'll, I'll, I would just tell you, that's because he believed in teamwork and he believed in, in, in building trust. He, he is a tremendous communicator. 
Uh, he's a good listener. Uh, he didn't have all the answers when he sat down at the table. He would do his homework. He would listen to you. He understood the restrictions that we had in some cases and the capabilities that we had. Uh, I never felt strong-armed by the, by the ambassador. And now I, I worked for Southern Command, so I had a, a four-star general that I worked for that worked very closely with him. But when it came time to, for an operation or humanitarian assistance exercise like Nuevas Horizontes, uh, I felt like I was going around the humanitarian sector with a, with a friend. Because of his knowledge of, of the issues, and it was very apparent uh, early on that he already had a lot of, of knowledge on these issues that applied to Panama, that coupled with his, with his really uh, ability to get along with people. After Bill Hughes finished his term as ambassador, and he returned to South Jersey and was named a distinguished scholar in public policy at Stockton College, now University, in Pomona. There for three years, he taught a course called Inside Politics, A New Look. In 2008, the school established the William J. Hughes Center for Public Policy, which spurs research and debate on civic and economic issues concerning Southern New Jersey. The William J. Hughes Public Policy Center at Stockton University came about uh, after I taught there for a number of years. Uh, when I came back from Panama, the one thing I wanted to do was to teach. And I taught a course in public policy called Inside Politics. I think the role of the Hughes Center is bring issues to, to people, also to give students the opportunity. We employ students in, in all the different uh, facets of the Hughes Center and to get people interested in good government. Uh, if we can get young people wanting to run for government, that should be one of the aims of the Hughes Center. There's a lot of different other aims that I think are very important, but I'm excited about the history now and what has been accomplished and what will be accomplished in the future. I've known, of course, of Ambassador Hughes because I've been around this area um, for many years, I guess four decades or so, so maybe even five decades. So I, I certainly knew him as our congressperson and, um, and you know, watched his career throughout the region. And, and when he became involved at Stockton, I mean, he adjuncted at Stockton. He always was here. He was always a presence. He was supportive of the, of, of the at then college. Um, he um, would attend events at the college his wife Nancy. Um, he was a supporter of the university, college back then. Um, so I've known him, I can't pinpoint the exact time, but for a long time. Now I became closer to him uh, as he got, as, as A, I matured uh, as an administrator at the university, and um, as he became more engaged uh, as what ultimately became uh, the Hughes Center for Public Policy. Everybody respected Bill, still does. Everybody respected when Bill sat down with him. He listened, he just didn't speak. He was passionate about what he cared about, but he listened. And when he disagreed, he did not attack. He did not talk about the other person having a bad motive. And he reached agreement, moved the process along. He did the same thing as a diplomat, Bill. You have that touch. You have that ability, you have that sense of all politics is personal, and it is all personal. And you know, it's, a, it's only through consensus and cooperation that the United States can continue to function. We're the most heterogeneous democracy in the history of the world, and there's no other way. In order for a democracy like ours to continue to function like it should, it requires a certain sort of honorable citizen most people would like to be remembered well, but few can do so with the confidence of William Hughes. This man of modest background defied the odds. There was something different about him, a refusal to be defeated, an insistence to achieve. What I see in Bill is somebody who has never let the position that he has go to his head. He's somebody, when he walks outside at night and he looks at the dome of the Capitol, all lit up and sees himself in the middle of the greatest system of government in the world, he, who still 
steps back and says, I can't believe that I'm here. I can't believe that I have this opportunity to serve at this level of government. Well, I've known Congressman Hughes for a good part of my life, for about 20 years actually. And um, I'm just very thankful at this point for the last three years to have had the opportunity to work for him. Man, you just after working for him, you just respect so much. And the amount, what I've learned from him, from both the substantive aspect of the law as well as the practical legislative process has been invaluable to me. And I will always remember that and very grateful to have had the opportunity to work for him, for a man that I respect and so many people do respect. Uh, he is a considerate human being. Um, he exudes civility. Um, in many respects, he is almost a 180 from what we see every single day now. And he simply is been, he was a great representative for this region. I consider Bill Hughes to be uh, first a gentleman, secondly a very smart individual, and a very balanced individual. What he wants, he gets. He's kind, he's smart, energetic and amazing. Uh, his, his deep commitment uh, to, to the people of South Jersey and to other people um, is, is incredible. And while others may talk about it, he provided just the best example uh, of public service and of family that anybody could, could ever have. Bill, Bill is a man of um, uh, very much of, of high in, high integrity. He is uh, someone who's interested in people and a, and a lot of different people, and uh, is someone that I think once you get to know him, it's someone that uh, um, you admire. Someone who is a friend uh, of yours uh, through thick and thin. But I uh, I'm not sure that my career in the Senate, to the extent that it was successful, would have been successful without Bill Hughes. I would uh, consider Ambassador Hughes just a wonderful person of integrity and honesty, and he didn't play the dirty tricks that a lot of politicians do, and you know, no scandals in his administration when he uh, was in Congress. So it's a pretty remarkable that from, from local here that we have someone like that that represented us. Well, Bill is a very caring person. Bill uh, is a family person. He is a, a, a guy who cares a lot about the things that are important to southern part of New Jersey and to our country. And so it's, uh, it's just been a pleasure working with him. And I think the most salient thing I, I realized about him is, is his fundamental integrity. Thank you for showing us and having the best parents ever. Bill and Nancy Hughes and their family have done so much for Ocean City. He was instrumental in getting money for our community center, our bridges. I mean, there hasn't been too many things in Ocean City that Ambassador and his wife and family have not been a part of. So as the mayor of Ocean City, I'm internally grateful for all his contributions. Although it took 15 years, Hughes That's finally saw legislation work. designed to protect our ocean and marine life and put a stop to ocean dumping. Hughes says, the best advice he could give to his successor would be to pick an area of expertise and concentrate. With 435 members of Congress, you can easily get lost. Other advice? Go home often. Don't lose touch with the people who put you in office. It is said that when you lose your passion for something, it is time to move on. For Bill Hughes, it is time to move on, although he has not lost his passion. From a Depression-era childhood in a quiet Jersey town, William Hughes advanced to become a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, ambassador to Panama, and a distinguished scholar at Stockton University. Meanwhile, he built a reputation for fighting for what he believed in, such as gun control and environmental protection. Despite his successes, he was never seen as someone who served only his political career, but as a man willing to compromise in the best interests of citizens everywhere. He did what was right and did it repeatedly. William John Hughes went from delivering newspapers to having his name on the front page, from studying civics to having his civic achievements studied. Dissatisfied with the world he encountered, he set about to change it and succeeded. For him, the main reward was in the accomplishment of what he chose to do, but we may also reward him with our gratitude 
and praise. Well, we hope you have enjoyed tonight's presentation. Uh, as we sign off, uh, we once again recognize our sponsors and Hughes Center partners who have helped make this possible. I'm John Fringen from the Hughes Center for Public Policy. Thank you and good night.